Justice. Um, good morning to everybody or good evening, uh, depend upon where you're located um, within the US. So it's uh, start of the evening here, but I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to talk about an approach to sustainable cleaning. And this is something that um, comes, it, it varies from, from site to site in terms of what we define as sustainable and also what the goals are as, we, as we'll talk through this in the lecture. Um, there is an opportunity at the end of the presentation uh, to ask questions, uh, hopefully a large portion of the presentation at the end to address questions that, that may come up. I did include um, a little bit of background and Linda did an excellent job uh, going over this uh, at the introduction. Um, I've been with Steris now for, oh, uh, 15 years and over 10 years in the industry prior to Steris. Um, and I've been visiting uh, different sites in over 30 countries uh, for the past 15 years um, and supporting a wide range of applications uh, from traditional pharmaceuticals to API manufacturing to biopharmaceuticals, vaccines, solid oral dose, liquid oral dose um, uh, industries. And um, like I said, I focus in on cleaning uh, and sustainability is something to, uh, that we all strive for uh, when we think about uh, cleaning processes. So the goal for this presentation is for the audience to become familiar with sustainable models uh, that targets the process, uh, the planet, uh, people uh, from a GMP cleaning perspective. And I think that's important um, to focus in on that GMP cleaning aspect of it uh, because it does change how we think about uh, sustainable cleaning. Um, and also to, to make certain that I share some experiences um, in understanding of regulatory guidance and what some companies have done to try to improve their cleaning, make a more sustainable uh, approach to cleaning. And lastly is to provide recommendations uh, for establishing a sustainable cleaning uh, program. And with that, I think I'm gonna go ahead and and have um, ISPE uh, post a poll uh, to see, to kind of gauge the audience in terms of how they feel about uh, sustainability and what sites and corporate um, culture is asking uh, of the individual sites. And I don't know, Linda or Christina, do you wanna show the poll? Oh, excellent, good, that worked. Um, so are there current sustainable goals uh, for the cleaning program at your sites? Uh, with the selection being uh, a need to reduce the cleaning agent or chemicals used at site, maybe a reduction in water used, maybe a reduction in energy, maybe a reduction of the chemical waste, maybe there's some phosphate restrictions, and maybe to improve personal safety, um, and lastly, um, there is no sustainable sustainability goals uh, for the site. So we have nearly half the people have answered. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, we have a quarter of the group, 25%, um, indicate none. Um, or other. Um, we didn't really specify which one that was. Um, other than that, we see kind of a, a little bit of a split across the board. So reduction in cleaning chemistries or chemicals, um, reduction in water used, uh, reduction in waste, and then improved personal safety. So um, quite a good diversity in terms of, of some of the goals. And I think that aligns with what I see that um, site-specific sustainable goals can vary from site to site, and sometimes they're driven from a corporate uh, strategy. So what is the, the company indicating to the shareholders 
or to the public in terms of, of items. And that could be, and you know, some of these actually come up with, you know, where the company is located. I know when I go to the Western US, there's a big demand to reduce water um, consumption. And I go to other parts of the world and it's things in terms of cleaning time or, or the chemicals because of maybe agriculture or, uh, or the dairy industry in that area. So thank you for, uh, for answering the questions um, and very successful poll, Linda, Christina, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Okay, so the current state of GMP cleaning, um, equipment cleaning is required for pharmaceutical drug regulations. That is not a surprise. Um, it's really to uh, protect uh, the quality of the product and the patient's safety receiving uh, the product. And cleaning and sanitizing may be necessary, but may also present health and environmental concerns uh, in the sense of the chemicals used as well as the waste generated uh, from the cleaning process. And pollutants depend upon the type and quantity that is produced as a function of the cleaning process. Uh, so if you're manufacturing uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs, you may be using solvents uh, for the cleaning. Those are going to uh, potentially generate uh, waste that has to be uh, properly um, removed and treated. Um, and if you are manufacturing other products, um, there may also be some concerns. So it's really dependent upon the type and quantity um, that you are, um, are generating. There is a number of different regulations that impact on cleaning agents. And this presentation is not geared to go over each one of them, um, but wanted to kind of pick out a couple um, and then kind of share uh, some of that information with you. Um, the first couple is, is very specific to the US. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Occupational Health and Safety. And they talk about list of acceptable ingredients, as well as providing regulations in regards to labeling, safety, handling, and uh, disposal, as well as hazard communications. Um, and then we get into maybe Health Canada, um, and that's through um, Hazardous uh, Product Act and Control Product Regulations and the focus in on labels and safety and worker education and training. Um, in the European Union, um, we have, uh, this one is quite common uh, that I see, is the European Regulation 648-2004. And that is focused on uh, the biodegradability of um, cleaning agents and specific surfactants within uh, within formulations. So that's something that you would commonly see on a cleaning agent um, safety data sheet uh, sold within the European Union. Um, we also have uh, European chemical agencies uh, requiring that all chemical manufacturers identify and manage risk list linked to the substances they supply. Um, good um, in terms of um, uh, information. And then most recently, uh, there is the World Health Organization document regarding health-based exposure limits. And I thought this brings up because the World Health Organization applies to a lot of um, countries, and it is kind of a, a governing document uh, to reference. Um, and there is a section, um, and I'm going to cover this in, in detail, uh, actually verbatim later on in the talk, but it talks about the cleaning agent selection it also discusses appropriate, uh, they should be appropriate for their intended use, um, justified, um, there's proof of effectiveness and appropriateness, um, which includes concentration, composition, removal, um, and the use to, um, as a function of cleaning studies. So I'm gonna spend a little time in terms of reading that section. And I think that's very important when we think about cleaning agents, for GMP applications, cleaning programs, for um, 
uh, GMP applications. Now the regulations that impact germicidal agents, and this is something that um, uh, I'll just cover briefly, um, no widely accepted definition of environmentally uh, preferred uh, germicidal agent. Um, and the idea of kind of a non-toxic germicidal agent is really kind of an unrealistic criteria. I mean, they are designed to kill organisms. And I was at one study probably about, I think this was now about nine years ago, and they were arguing over a chemical um, uh, formulation and the studies were performed in mice and rats. And then somebody indicated that, you know, this, the ingredient is there to um, kill um, mice and rats. The product is a rodenticide. Um, we should not be having this discussion around toxicity in, in mice or rats because that's the function of the product. Uh, so with germicides, it's, it, they're designed to, to kill organisms. Um, so the impact can be, but things that we have to worry about is that the impact can be reduced um, based on the proper application techniques, um, making appropriate choices uh, for the applications of the products, as well as understanding um, the dilution of the product that is exposed to the operators or exposed to the environment after use. And then obviously having an understanding of what are the alternatives and how effective are the alternatives for that purpose. Um, and I think that that is a, a key thing when you think about germicides um, and environmentally friendly germicides. So what is sustainability? Um, sustainability is um, a process or a state uh, that can be maintained at a certain level as long as it is wanted. I think that's very uh, simplified and it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability to meet future needs. And I think that's important. It beats the current demand and it's also looking at uh, the future. Now, three segments um, that I'm gonna be talking about related to this is in regards to considerations for the planet considerations for the process and considerations uh, for the people. And I think that's a, a, a very simplified approach to thinking about sustainability. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as a 3P model uh, and that works well, planet, people, process. So let's kind of explore the first one. Um, well, first I wanna, just indicate why it's important. Um, and I don't know how much I need to spend on this, but there was an article that was recently published and this was um, uh, by Verdict and it published in Pharmaceutical Technology in February of 2021. And it indicated environmental sustainability was voted as the area that needs to be addressed the most by the pharmaceutical industry according to 43% of the respondents. Climate change was considered as the most pressing environmental issue by 52% of the respondents who voted. Um, and the ones who voted for environmental sustainability uh, followed by pollution, which was 32%, natural resources, which is 11%, and biodiversity, which is 5%. So this is a topic on the minds of um, individuals within the pharmaceutical, the GMP uh, industries. Now, one of my colleagues also kind of reached out uh, to uh, a number of multinational companies um, within uh, the US and Europe and, and kind of um, did a kind of some voice of customer type of an approach and trying to see exactly what were things that were in the minds of, of some of those, um, those companies. One was to utility consumption uh, and specifically water usage and cleaning. 
um, and followed by um, energy uh, use in cleaning. Uh, so that was something that um, was brought up. Uh, the second thing was understanding, optimizing the cleaning process and specifically trying to drive out some waste uh, within the cleaning. And the age old phenomenon, age old um, idea of the time spent cleaning is time away from production. Um, so matter of trying to, to look at where there's waste that can be removed. Um, second thing is, you know, by removing some waste, you free up equipment for production. So equipment availability and reliability. There was also um, discussions around the use of acids uh, within the cleaning process and whether or not it's needed and if so, at what frequency. Um, and that's, that's something that I think um, we're not gonna necessarily cover too much in this presentation, uh, but that's something that, well, actually I will talk a little bit about it because um, we have been seeing more and more research around the use of acids and the value of those as part of routine cleaning and part of uh, stainless steel maintenance and also uh, sanitization of equipment. Now, there was also discussion around um, degradation and viral inactivation um, and specifically degradation of active ingredients, uh, both large molecules and small molecules. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, and then moved into safety and performance. And that was more in the lines of ensuring that you had a, root, a robust process. So error proofing the process, um, making certain that the operators have a safe work environment and, um, and the general workforce is better educated and connected to what the sustainability um, goals are uh, within the site or within the corporate culture. Uh, so that was some information that was kind of collected and that's in line with what I see um, and when I visit uh, different sites and I lecture at different events is that it, um, the views of sustainability vary from site to site and generally it's one or more items that come up as things that they want that the site wants to improve. And occasionally it's driven down from uh, the corporate in terms of things like reduction of phosphates or reduction of water usage across um, all the sites. So let's spend a, a few minutes to, to kind of discuss uh, considerations around the planet. And, and this is something that is continuously adapting and evolving uh, and not, <laughs> All um, items, uh, uh, it can be regional <laughs> uh, and as well as, as country uh, based. Um, so, th so some of the items that we're gonna cover in this section is the talk about the cleaning agents. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, active ingredients, uh, large molecules and small molecules, um, some volatile organic compounds, uh, waste discharge, um, reagents and solvents that are used, as well as iron or extraneous particles as we get into um, considerations uh, around uh, the planet. Now, um, I mentioned this earlier on, the World Health Organization um, has a draft document out on health-based exposure limits um, it's in the second, it's in its first revision um, and it has section 5.3 on cleaning agents. So I thought I would share this because this is, I think quite relevant in terms of how we look at cleaning agents. Um, and so it starts off with kind of cleaning agents, including solvents and detergents used in cleaning processes should be selected with care. They should be appropriate for their intended use and the selection of the relevant cleaning agent should be scientifically justified. There should be proof of effectiveness and appropriateness of the selected cleaning agent. And other points to consider include the concentration in which they are used, their composition and removal of the residue to an acceptable level. 
And lastly is when the cleaning agents are used in the cleaning processes, these should be included in cleaning process development studies and cleaning validation. And I think that that really kind of captures how we want to be looking at cleaning agents. I see a lot of things when we talk about sustainability, about third party review of formulations, third party certification of formulations. And I think that as an industry, we need to ground ourselves that the cleaning agents um, should be selected with care. They should be appropriate for their intended use. There should be a scientific justification for using those. There should be some proof of effectiveness and appropriateness. And that there should be an understanding of why the, the, param the concentrations used, why the components are there, and how to show that it's been safely removed. And preferably you have some type of cleaning study that's used to help work through that. And I think that that is um, a really a good way to look at the cleaning agents uh, for this and not rely on, on some, on, and really kind of look closely at some of the third party um, certifications. So let's think about this from the, from the cleaning agent perspective. And we've seen a number of, of companies take cleaning agent suppliers, look at their um, core products, as well as look at new products. And I refer to this as kind of innovation and risk management from the cleaning uh, chemistry perspective. Um, we want to be thinking about um, uh, the contingency and sustainability of the formulations. We want to also be thinking about functional formulation, and I'll talk through that a little bit. And then also trying to think about doing more with less, expanding performance applications if we've selected a cleaning agent within the site um, for our cleaning programs. And this is just um, some examples in regards to, it's common to use an alkaline detergent. Um, and um, in this case, there's a new cleaning agent looking at functional formulation of the new cleaning agent with the legacy product or existing formulation. With that, we wanna be thinking about, you know, the different raw materials because that helps out in contingency planning. Um, want to make certain that there's analyzable components in the formulation and that there is um, a biodegradable surfactants that are chosen. And that goes along with the, the European regulations that I noted. Um, the other thing that's, that's good about um, alkaline detergents is they have good bactericidal virucidal properties. Um, so that's something to kind of expand the performance of them. Um, and also we've seen some alkaline detergents now with biofilm remediation claims. Again, taking a look at that, um, that chemistry and adjusting the parameters like concentration, time or temperature and expanding the applications for um, an existing product on site or a new product that has similar functional uh, performance uh, to the existing product. And the far right just has some things that we want to be thinking about um, when we look at a sustainable cleaning agent is that it has um, the right chemistry, appropriate chemistry, a good rinse profile, the toxicity or permitted daily exposure is available. There's indications on an in terms of environmental impact or assessment. There's safety considerations. Um, there's global availability. There's stability in the formulation as well as use dilution. There's technical support. It has a good overall cost. And then it, of course it is, it performs as a cleaning agent. But we're seeing companies look at their formulations in the sense of, how do they, how can we expand the, their use at their site? So we're not seeing more and more chemistries that are very specific for one application. And we also see that <clears throat> same approach for, for acid products. Um, so a lot of times we see things like nitric acid <clears throat> or phosphoric acid 
as the legacy acid detergent on a site. And there may be some, some phosphate restrictions um, that's found with the phosphoric acid formulation. And there's obviously personal safety issues with nitric acid uh, type formulations. We do see some newer acid type products. Uh, sometimes they're, in this case, a citric acid based product, um, which again is low in phos phosphate free. It functionally, it is um, good at removing inorganic residues, can be used for rouge or scale removal. So that's removal of iron oxide or calcium magnesium. And then it can also be used for passivation of stainless steel. So restoring that corrosion resistant chrome oxide layer. And we've actually even seen some of the acid detergents now get um, uh, bactericidal or virucidal claims on the product. So again, taking a look at um, newer formulations that expand out uh, the performance as well as having uh, similar functionality as, as legacy type products. Now, what about active ingredients um, in regards to, to waste disposal? Um, and this is something, um, and we're gonna talk about this from a large molecule perspective and then a small molecule perspective. Um, and and there's just a little bit on this slide, and I'm gonna try to, 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 uh, to break it down a little bit. One is, this is a biopharmaceutical process. So we have downstream samples, A, B, and C, and then some buffers, um, A and B. I'm currently using uh, water, uh, for their cleaning, um, cleaning times um, um, are quite long, um, and then in using you know laboratory coupon type testing, indicated that um, these particular residues really were not cleaned with water, um, at least to a visible residue limits on a three three hundred four stainless steel coupon. Um, using an alkaline, a low concentration alkaline detergent, reduced that time to five minutes and was able to meet visually clean. Um, so right away, there's kind of a savings in terms of time associated with that, um, as well as um, an, imp an improvement in terms of the cleaning process. Now, one of the things that's also kind of with an alkaline detergent is for biologics is dependent upon the concentration, temperature, and exposure time, you can also look at degrading the active ingredient. And that's something that is um, noted uh, when you um, review like permitted daily exposures, health-based exposure limits, you can look at degradation of the active as a way um, in terms of, of setting appropriate limits uh, for the active ingredient. So on our far right, we have an SDS page um, uh, gel electrophoresis, um, which shows the protein ladder. So this would be a control in our far um, in lane number two. And then we have um, the alkaline detergent at 45, 60, and 60. And then lane number four, is at a 20 minute as opposed to a five minutes. And you have your um, control lanes at different concentrations, and then a repeat of those three columns, uh, three detergent. Um, and you can indicate from this that, that defined protein banding in our controls is degraded if a 3% detergent is used 60 degrees for 20 minutes. Um, so this is where you know that the cleaning can occur at 1% five minutes, um, but you may not get degradation at those conditions as seen by the SDS page. So if degradation of the active is important as a function of your cleaning process, as a function of sending that waste to drain, then you want to look at doing a slight increase in concentration, increase in temperature and increase in time to achieve that additional um, goal. This can also be 
reviewed with small molecules as well. Um, so in this case, we have, um, this is actually an insecticide, um, an API. Um, we have, so, and this is an excipient in our far right on coupons and an API plus excipient. Um, and these were dried onto the surface and evaluate the cleaning process um, in looking at specifically an alkaline detergent or a neutral detergent as part of the cleaning process. And then we have our concentration, time, and temperature to ensure a clean surface. And you can see that the alkaline detergent was able to clean at 1% for five minutes, eight degrees. Um, the neutral detergent was cleaned at 2%, 30 minutes, 60 degrees. So there is a give and take in terms of temperature, time, and concentration depend upon the cleaning agent. And this is the reason why it's important to think about or to conduct uh, laboratory testing to kind of see where those parameters fall uh, for any given soil on, on a substrate. Now, one of the things that was a concern here was their analytical method, the HPLC method that they were using um, they're worried of whether or not it was going to be effective on a degraded um, active ingredient. And looking at that molecule, it seems susceptible to alkaline conditions. Um, and uh, so as part of the cleaning, you evaluate, um, you can evaluate degradation of that active similar to a large molecule. And it two, two things that it serves. One is it helps out in terms of determining that analytical method to show that the, the active ingredient has been removed to a safe level would be valid. Or to assess you know, whether or not to um, collect the waste or that it's safe to send to drain as um, you know, a degraded active or as an active ingredient very important things to, to assess. Um, so in this case, 19-F-NMR um, was used because of the fluorine group and the HPLC method um, was not um, available at the time um, of the testing. Um, and the control showed, you know, three in the top right, three nice peaks um, indicating uh, the fluorine groups within the molecule, um, expose that to the alkaline detergent. And you can see that um, the, those um, peaks are no, are, have been um, broken up, indicating that there's degradation of that molecule um, with the alkaline cleaning process. Um, and now in terms of exactly what that is, um, um, that's not determined as part of this testing. Uh, but something that can additional work can can look at identifying that, and there's also some software that can that can uh, be used to help out with that, um, and then evaluate the neutral condition. And the neutral condition um, essentially left um, the peaks intact, so it can remove the residue without degrading the residue as a function of the removal process. Um, so in this case, it's kind of an interesting um, dilemma. You can clean very quickly at a low concentration at a high pH and temperature, um, or you can clean a little slower at a higher concentration and lower temperature. And it depends upon what you want to do with the, the active ingredient as a function of that cleaning process. Good information to have as part of a review. Now, in terms of um, the planet, um, also want to look at minimize uh, water and air pollution. Uh, volatile organic compounds is a concern uh, because they may pose a threat to, to both air and water quality. Um, generally, the hydrocarbons, um, uh, such as uh, uh, things like methanol, methanol toluene, um, can have high boiling points well, can have low boiling points, sorry, um, in, that are usually less than 100 degrees Celsius. Um, they're often used um, to uh, clean um, active pharmaceutical ingredients uh, do, using solvent reflux, 
uh, type of approach, it does lead to, to long cleaning times and also um, quite a bit of costs associated with collecting and disposal of that. Um, so there is incentives to, to look at an, um, an aqueous cleaning process to reduce the use of solvents as a function of cleaning. Um, and we see, especially with newer API sites, that they're all pretty much designed for um, uh, aqueous-based cleaning, and then they may use solvents uh, for the first rinse or for a final rinse um, of the equipment. Um, we do see some regulations in different parts of the world. Um, this is just a reference to the Clean Air Act um, in the US um, that lists solvents as hazardous air pollutants. Um, so they do have restrictions in volatile organic carbon. And sometimes it's also uh, um, mandated per different areas of the US as well. We also see um, some restrictions around different components within the formulations. I talked about surfactants earlier. Uh, they're very useful in cleaning agents. They really are efficient in terms of improving wetting, uh, emulsification, which helps in uh, removing insoluble material, as well as keeping that insoluble material dispersed and suspended so that it can be sent to, uh, to drain or off, at least off the, the, the vessel walls. Um, but we do want to be make concern that they are compliant with local regulations and, um, and that um, oftentimes they'll be specified on the safety data sheet if the products are sold in Europe and they should be available um, with a confidentiality agreement from some of those suppliers or the cleaning agents. Now, there's sometimes restrictions around keelants, um, and keelants help out in terms of, of um, uh, preventing free metal ions uh, that can interact with surfactants to reduce the performance. Um, keelants can also help bind inorganic residues and help remove them from the surface. Um, but there is some restrictions. Um, we see that there's um, EDTA, uh, which is a common keelant, um, has some slow biodegradability, and there is some um, restrictions in Switzerland. That's the only country that I'm aware of. And then there's also NTA, which is another common keelant, um, and that's been linked to uh, as a human carcinogen. Um, there's also been some cases in which there is restrictions in phosphates. Um, as well as nitrates, and that's in regards to uh, eutrophication, uh, which is um, uh, micro, micro blooms. Um. Now, another area that we see um, a concern is understanding um, the pH of the waste solution. This is probably one of the most common things that I find um, going out to different sites is monitoring and adjusting the pH of the waste stream. Um, and oftentimes, uh, the most of the cleaning agents that we see um, are either high pH alkaline or low pH acids. Uh, sometimes you can adjust those as part of your cleaning process. So the resulting discharge uh, from the site can be um, at or close to neutral. Um, other times, it's a matter of, of having a way to adjust the pH um, as part of um, uh, the drainage or as part of a neutralization system at a site. And a lot of times, the cleaning agent suppliers can help out in terms of which products can neutralize other products within the portfolio um, or help out in terms of which um, acids or bases to use. Um, and you do want to be a little cautious in regards to um, in-tank neutralization prior to drainage. Uh, sometimes that can lead to precipitation or, re um, or re redepositing of the residue onto a surface, which will require additional cleaning. Now, um, we also see um, some other tests that are performed as part of looking at a, um, a cleaning process. Um, 
the lethal concentration is normally uh, um, LC50 refers to uh, a lethal concentration of 50% of the population. It's typically done uh, with aquatic testing uh, for with minnows or daphnia, which are um, aquatic fleas. Um, but that's sometimes used quite a bit to look at um, um, chemical discharge. Um, you also see uh, biological oxygen demand or chemical oxygen demand are uh, commonly used to assess biodegradability, uh, both uh, microbially and also um, chemically um, to look at um, the chemical oxygen demand, look at organics uh, within the formulation. And we do see some uh, restriction, some actual values or limits uh, set up by different areas. So California has um, an aquatic toxicity uh, referred to as California Title 22 of less than 500 mg per liter. And then the UK has a biological oxygen demand. And then Switzerland has a chemical oxygen demand and other countries have different uh, limits uh, set up. So something to, to review and then work with the chemical supplier to help out with that. A couple of other things to kind of keep in mind is uh, uh, a minimization of, of phthalates that are used. Um, these are emulsifying agents and suspending agents in a large um, variety of products. Um, and they're also primarily linked to plasticizers uh, from PVC piping and packaging materials. Uh, so that's something that oftentimes that you can understand that from your suppliers, whether or not there's uh, uh, phthalates uh, present. And we also see um, an interest in terms of packaging sizes. Uh, most of the cleaning agents are in recyclable materials, uh, such as high density polyethylene or polypropylene. Um, we see um, a lot of uh, end users think about bulk sizes to reduce the amount of packaging. And then also to work with concentrated formulation, again, to reduce uh, the amount of packaging. You do want to be conscious as you go up in package sizes that it's safe for the operators to work with. So you may have to adjust the tools at the site to make certain that the operators can safely move um, the containers that are coming into the site. So let's kind of shift over to processes. And with processes, we want to be thinking about those, those critical cleaning parameters, um, such as the water that's used, uh, the cleaning agent in terms of concentration, the energy that's used, uh, the resources and the time um, in terms of the cleaning process. And we want to be thinking about optimizing that. And specifically in regards to reduction of waste. And sometimes that's referred to as MUDA. Now, as I talked about the kind of the World Health Organization um, health based exposure limits, talking about coupon testing, these are, this is really helpful in terms of investigating which parameters are critical and having some control over that. Um, so in this case, we have a coupon that has been soiled with the residue, conditioned to simulate the process, cleaned in a manner to simulate the process, and then also um, uh, evaluated for cleanliness. And this is a really, you can adjust the material of test, um, the coupon that's used for the, for the testing, the conditioning of the coupon in terms of temperature, um, or time, um, the cleaning methods from spray wash to cascading flow to ultrasonic to foaming, and even the acceptance criteria, um, similar to that earlier study that looked at um, uh, gel electrophoresis or NMR technology. Um, so you can do a number of different studies here to evaluate you know, whether or not what's critical as well as where this potential um, uh, ways in which you can um, improve the efficiency, reduce waste in your cleaning process. 
An example would be, you know, the effect of temperature. And temperature can be used with the pre-wash, can be used with the wash step, can be used with the post-wash, the second wash, the post-second wash, the final rinse, the drying step. It can be used a number of different um, areas within the process. And it's, it can be quite important. So things like an oily residue, oftentimes you want a hot pre-rinse. If it's a proteinaceous residue, you want an ambient temperature or low temperature pre-rinse. If you want to go in and reduce your drying time, you go in with a hot final rinse. Um, you know, so it can be quite um, important to understand the role of temperature. And a lot of times I see that the time it gets up to temperature is, um, can be quite significant depending upon whether or not you have electric or steam heating systems and so forth. Um, and it also can be driven based on the soil. Um, so we have an example here on our right that we have a petrolatum product at 50 degrees, you know, it, it's staying on the surface. As you get up to 60, it's staying on the surface. As you start to increase that to 70 or 80, it starts coming off the surface. So really kind of understand the impact of temperature as a function of, of your process is important. And you can do quite a bit of savings in terms of energy and time by understanding the role of temperature. Now, this can also be important for time too. Um, it is a, um, a similar relationship in the sense that you have time in each step of the process and you don't want to um, have too much time uh, for any particular step if it doesn't, if it's not warranted. Um, so in this case, on the image on your right, you have the percent removal as a function of number of rinses. Um, so we have a zero, meaning no rinse. As you go to one, two, and three rinses, it's coming off that surface. So after the third rinse, you're about 100% removed. So adding a fourth, fifth rinse um, adds time, adds water, adds waste to that process. Important to understand that. You also wanna be thinking about the mechanical forces involved. And that's important in terms of, un, uh, in terms of the cleaning. Um, it's important to kind of monitor that too. If temperature is critical, then monitor temperature. If time is, is, um, is, is important for that wash, then you, then you monitor that. Um, it's also good to understand the pressure going into uh, spray devices, because that can indicate whether or not there's any type of clog or impingement on that. Um, so it's a, it's a good thing to monitor. Um, static spray devices provide a nice uniform um, cleaning, nice uniform rinsing. Um, but it's going to be generally a lower pressure. As you get into dynamic spray devices, you've increased the pressure on the surface, so, but you have to assure that you have full coverage as part of the dynamic uh, spray device. Um, and that kind of drives into, you know, coverage is critical when you're talking about cleaning. Um, and the use of riboflavin, as kind of seen in this image here with this yellow-green, is a way to kind of assess coverage. Um, and that's prepared at a 0.2 grams per liter, um, coated the surface, and then you can do a quick rinse to, to ensure that you have coverage as part of the cleaning. Okay, we also have the effect of the cleaning chemistry. And choosing the right chemistry is an important parameter. And it can really help in terms of maximizing uh, productivity and reduction of waste. And the laboratory evaluations that I talked a little bit earlier is a great way to, to evaluate the right cleaning chemistry. And we wanna be thinking about the material construction as well as the condition of the process residue on that surface. Um, and a, a kind of an example of this is um, with the solubility of aspirin. And that's seen in the top right. We have um, the pH, which is an important um, uh, parameter for a cleaning agent. 
at the low pHs, as we go from pH one to, to more neutral, seven, eight, um, we're seeing very low solubility of aspirin. As we get above pH nine, we start to see the solubility increase. It's gonna be much easier to clean at the higher pHs. And we can take advantage of that um, by choosing a high pH cleaning agent. Um, and then the up images on the bottom, of, this is an elastomer, uh, glass, stainless steel. It's nice to, to check that. Some of them can be quite, um, some of them can be very easy to clean. Others can be quite challenging. I wanted to share an example here to kind of see how um, adjusting a cleaning process can really help out in terms of saving um, uh, cleaning agent, water, time. Uh, we have a legacy cleaning process here, um, a pre-rinse, two alkaline wash steps, followed by a rinse, an acid wash, and then three more rinses. Um, a couple of things to kind of jump out is, is obviously the, con the amount of cleaning agent that's used and also the time um, that is used for the cleaning process. So this alkaline wash is 95 minutes in two steps. And the acid wash is 130 minutes in two steps. And you have fairly, um, and so that's something that uh, to look closer at, is it the right cleaning agents to remove this residue? And by just adjusting the cleaning agent, you can reduce that cleaning agent co um, concentration and reduce the cleaning time and um, achieve um, a clean uh, process equipment. So in this case, quite a bit of reduction in terms of cleaning agent. So it was 90% reduction of cleaning agent, 30% reduction of the time, 11% reduction of the water usage, just by kind of evaluating that cleaning agent um, that's used to clean that process soil under those parameters and then on the small scale models and then apply that to the larger scale equipment. Now I wanna spend a few minutes and talk about um, people and then we can wrap up uh, the, the webinar uh, with the Q&A session. Um, one of the things with people um, is, is personnel safety. And that's, that's extremely important um, when you talk, talk about sustainability. Um, the information can be found on the safety data sheet for the chemicals that are being used for cleaning. Um, it can also be um, good information on the product label as well as the safety department. And don't hesitate to reach out to the chemical suppliers. They should have some supplemental toxicity studies um, as well as some input in terms of how to safely work with the chemicals that are being provided. You know, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you also have to remember that um, safety for a cleaning process always involves the product that you're using for the cleaning, as well as the process or application that it's being used at. And, um, and keep that in mind as you're working with concentrates, it's more risk than the use solution. As you're working at higher temperatures, it's more risk than at lower temperatures and so forth. So it's very important to, to think about the product as well as that process when it comes to personal uh, safety. We do see that um, clean in place systems um, as seen in the top right, in which case um, allows for um, cleaning without disassembly, um, uh, reduces operator exposure, allows you to go higher in concentrations and temperatures safely, um, is a nice way to kind of shift and, and have a, a safer cleaning process. Um, we also see clean out of place systems like the parts washer in the bottom uh, right hand side, you can load items in it and then you can go ahead and press start and it'll run through that cycle um, and you can again go with higher concentrations safely or higher temperatures much safely than with the manual cleaning process. 
when you go into a manual cleaning process, you want to be mindful that you should not um, contain the volatile organic carbons, the solvents, and or chemicals that are corrosive to skin. <clears throat> However, this may not be feasible. You may have to have those because again, they have to be appropriate for um, its use. And if that's what it requires to clean the process residue, then you have to adjust the safety to, um, uh, for that. Uh, so think about uh, safety glasses, uh, possibly face shields and rubber gloves for the operators. And of course, closed uh, toed safety shoes are very common when working with um, cleaning agent chemicals. Uh, just a couple of images here. We have an operator on the, on the left uh, cleaning um, that is a fluid bed dryer, the very bottom of it. And using a brush, you can see that face shield, gloves, closed toe shoes, um, uh, you know, common uh, PPE around a manual cleaning process. And then the image on the right is a foaming type application. Foaming is a kind of a nice way uh, in regards to manual cleaning the large equipment because you can use high concentrations of cleaning agent. It clings to the surface and you can rinse it. So you have less splashback um, to the operator and you can have better um, contact time on the surface. Um, wanted to share an example here of a, a cleaning process that was being used uh, for actually for a bioreactor. Um, in this case, it was quite interesting is that the bioreactor would run for 14 days. They would use some anti-foam to reduce the foaming during the run. Um, then it would uh, be cleaned um, in an eight hour cycle, which consisted of sodium hydroxide and citric acid. Um, and then the tank would still not be visibly clean. Um, so they would manually wipe down um, the walls of the tank. And you can imagine um, doing that in the sense of, you know, um, an operator. Um, and actually, they would use a ladder as well, um, and and do tank entry. And it would require um, three people, in the sense of one inside, one outside, um, as a spotter, um, and then a third person um, for the cleaning process. Um, so. Um, operations and environmental health and safety were not happy um, with the cleaning process um, and to really kind of take a look at that. Um, and it goes back to kind of understand that process. Uh, so in this case, to take the residue, which is a cell culture residue, heated it and air dried it onto a coupon and it's seen on the image on your right. And it was clean with an alkaline based chemistry, low temperature and a short time not really an issue. So it was kind of hard to see what was going on with that, that cleaning process. But as we looked a little closer at it, um, what they were doing was adding um, a, a compound uh, called PETAMAC, um, which allows for flocculation of the uh, cell culture debris, which improves uh, filtration, improves that first separation step. And what the, what the, you know, in this case, that epitomac and whatever it was fluctuating, that cell debris material was making it much more difficult uh, for the cleaning. Um, um, and, you know, we've, I know I've worked with the manufacturer of this and, and looked at um, using an alkaline chemistry is very efficient, but actually using a detergent additive with um, an oxidative component in addition to the alkaline cleaning agent, really helps down in terms of breaking down this, this polymer. And, um, and it really improves the cleaning performance. Um, so in this case, they actually did a first run um, with um, using an alkaline-based cleaning agent, and they showed some issues in terms of cleaning. Um, so it was pretty consistent with um, that type of um, polymer um, as well as uh, into mixed with the cell culture. But incorporating a detergent additive with hydrogen peroxide um, improved the cleaning performance 
uh, drastically, and that was repeated in multiple runs. And in fact, you know, adjusting the, the cleaning agent that was used was able to see a reduction in, in water usage, reduction in, in, um, in the hours of cleaning, uh, specifically and removing of the manual cleaning of the vessel. And that correlates to, you know, reduction in overall cost. Um, so if there is some cleaning issues, um, then it's kind of nice to take a look at that and see if there is some sustainability goals driven in that as well. So a couple of things and kind of wrap it up and open it up to questions, uh, Linda, is, is the focus in on um, defining sustainability cleaning goals. And like I mentioned, it varies from site to site. And, and, um, and oftentimes it's driven by uh, the corporate uh, location or the, the local municipality or the country in which you're in. Um, there is some innovative products out there um, that have taken into account uh, process sustainability as in the design of the products. And we've even seen some companies look at um, the legacy products and making, expanding their versatility uh, within the cleaning um, uh, space. And also um, consider some new applications for current approved products. I talked about you know, the acid product. Um, we've sometimes seen that obviously traditionally for neutralization of an alkaline cleaning agent, but we've also seen it for uh, stainless steel maintenance. So maintaining that corrosion resistant layer. And we've now kind of seen it also um, for sanitization and viral inactivation. So again, taking a look at um, what the products you're currently using and can they be used for more than one application uh, within the site. And we've seen, we've talked quite a bit about um, optimizing process and really kind of take a look at that cleaning process that's being used. Is there an opportunity to reduce the, the cleaning agent um, that's being used, reduce the utility requirements, um, especially kind of water and energy? Um, is there improvement that could be made to the operator safety in handling the chemicals during the cleaning process? And, and lastly is really take a look at um, the impact to the environment of your cleaning process. And we've talked about um, uh, the waste discharge and understanding what's actually going to waste and, and what, um, what adjustments need to be made looking at today and looking at into the future. Uh, so hopefully um, you got something uh, good out of the, the talk today. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Linda and Christina to handle some questions. And I'm going to look and see if there's anything in the chat function. Thank you very much, Paul. A wonderful presentation. Hope that everything uh, was clear for everyone. Please do post your questions in the chat or feel free to unmute yourselves and ask Paul the question personally. Uh, we have a question from Jong Hyuk Lim from Celtrion. Thank you for your questions. Uh, Neo answered the first one, but the second one was with regards to optimizing cleaning process and how Steris sets the mechanical action in your lab. There must be a factor affecting the cleaning performance from mechanical action such as spray ball. Your comment, Paul? Okay, yeah, I'm looking at where that question came in because I just opened up the chat function. So this is down a little bit. Um, so, okay, that must be affected. 10.01 a.m. Okay, let me see. Um, yeah, so there is, um, so in our, I mean, one of the things that I do is I manage a processing cleaner evaluation laboratory and we focus in on evaluating the cleaning chemistry using um, agitated immersion as a kind of a simple tool to evaluate that. And then we also kind of go into um, 
uh, CIP cleaning applications uh, such as spray device and cascading flow. And we monitor, we have an understanding of what is the pressure into the spray arm, as well as the, the flow rate down the sidewall of the tank. And that helps us in terms of correlating the agitate immersion with a CIP cleaning application. Um, there is some um, ways in which you can shift to a more dynamic spray device to improve the action on the surface. And for some soils, that can be quite helpful in terms of removing. I know things that would have like titanium dioxide, um, those are quite challenging to remove. Um, and oftentimes having some increased spray impingement really helps remove a thin white residue as a result of that. Um, I know that that's not a particular soil that um, Celtron may see, but that is something where uh, the, in, the impingement may really help out. Um, another thing that we've seen is that um, this is specifically for um, Biofarm, um, that sometimes the air liquid interface, um, so that is where the liquid and the air, um, you can sometimes see some rings form inside vessels. And having a dynamic spray device or having more direct impingement around that area can make a big difference in terms of cleaning some of that hydrophobic polymeric um, type residue that sometimes builds up at that air liquid interface ring. Um, hopefully that addressed the question, Linda. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions? Uh, yes, I do. Oh. Paul, this is Sammy. Hey, Sammy. How are you? Uh, just to add on to your comment you just posted on the air liquid interface, the other thing that we keep seeing is the uh, slip agents. They even come in in the media, and so that would be that's a challenge for the cleaning also. Uh, so the the spray the type of spray device would help with this a rotating spray ball or a fixed spray ball. And uh, exposure time is uh, is one of the solutions. Yeah, that was actually um, we spent some time and actually published in pharmaceutical engineering on on that topic, uh, Sammy. Um, yeah, things like erisamide, um, uh, those types of slip agents, and these are on plastic materials used for generally for raw materials so that the plastic bags can open easily and then you can fill it with the raw materials. And sometimes that gets transferred in, especially in the buffer tanks and media prep tanks, in which case they'll have a nice defined band at that air liquid interface level. And these slip agents are, are polymers, they're hydrophobic in nature, and they can be have very high melting rates. So having, um, a cleaning agent, generally an alkaline cleaning agent with surfactants um, help out in terms of removing it. And I've also found that using an oxidative mechanism with the cleaning agent really helps break down those polymers. And I agree, Sammy, um, increasing the action on that is also very, very good at helping to remove that. Um, but that has been a, that's been quite a challenge um, in the industry. And one of the things to kind of think about with those is whether or not you want to address them from a cleaning perspective or address it from a maintenance perspective. Um, if the buffers and media are going through filtration as part of a standard process, oftentimes that will, um, um, it doesn't seem to, to, to migrate over into that holding vessel after that filtration process. Um, so it really um, is just in that initial blend tank. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. There's a question from Rosalie, which is, in your experience, did you encounter any difficulties in cleaning antifoam from silicone materials, especially if those remnants after CIP, if any got steamed and hardened following an SIP cycle? Yeah, silicone material can be quite challenging. Um, and especially as it's being added to um, a bioreactor 
um, because now you have uh, it's there because um, foam is generated, the silicone is added to com to compress the to collapse the foam. Um, so you got kind of a layering effect at that um, air liquid interface. And sometimes that silicone you're using varying amounts. Um, so sometimes it's hard to have a single cleaning cycle that's going to be reproducible over and over again, because sometimes that amount can vary uh, based on how much foam is generated during that uh, manufacturing process. Um, and sometimes the molecular weight of the silicone makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, anytime that I'm working with um, uh, anti-foam um, in a cleaning application, I tend to like to look at uh, the, the residue with the anti-foam in it and then also the residue alone, as well as the anti-foam alone, and see if um, there is um, a difference that the anti-foam is making it much, much more difficult to clean, and it's not represented by uh, an equally, you know, an evenly mixed, homogenous mixed um, sample of the cell culture with the anti-foam. Uh, so that's kind of important. And definitely as you steam or bake residue on the surface, it typically makes it hard to clean. So if you're going in and doing a decontamination step prior to, to opening, you know, to cleaning your vessel, that's going to be more challenging. And you may, you know, this is where you can kind of take a look and, and say, can I do a chemical decontamination? Um, and then follow that with a cleaning instead of doing a steam decontamination. Um, but again, it's a way of taking a look at that, that cleaning step and what leads into that difficult cleaning step and see if there's some adjustments that can be made. Now, I want to expand that. Sometimes I see silicone also um, in the fill finish area on with stoppers and closures. And the silicone is used um, to prevent the, the closures from sticking. Um, so you can have some silicone built up on the stopper hopper, as well as the star wheel. And um, a lot of times um, companies look at just using hot water to, to clean that um, and not trying to introduce you know, cleaning agents or chemicals um, because it's related to the fill finish area. And some of those silicones are water insoluble. So it's, you know, at some point you have a buildup of silicone um, on, the, on the bowl, as well as, you know, potentially in the star wheel and other areas along the filling process. And eventually you're gonna have uh, sticking of those closures. Um, so again, it's a matter of taking a look at, you know, what that silicone is, how it's conditioned, um, so in this case, it could be kind of air dried if it's coated on the stopper. Um, if it goes through a parts washer and steam sterilized prior to going into um, back into the filling area, then if there is still some silicone on it, then it could be steamed and baked onto it, which again makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, but you may want to be looking at a cleaning process for that stopper bowl to remove that silicone. And that could be part of everyday cleaning or part of a, of a maintenance um, event to, to keep that um, stopper hopper and bowl clean um, so that you don't see um, uh, uh, failures in the filling line. But um, great question on that. Thanks, Rosalie, and thanks, Paul, for answering. I hope that that covers it. Um, does anyone want to unmute and ask a question or please do post it in the chat? This is your opportunity to ask the expert live. Uh, hi, Paul. Um, this is Preyna from Lonza. Okay, uh, you have shared, thanks for sharing uh, that legacy cleaning versus the new ways of cleaning. I was just wondering, is there anything available or any kind of studies available for that as a reference? Yeah, I mean, obviously um, uh, you can reach out to me in regards to um, products uh, from Steris. I'll be okay. happy to, to chat with you about that. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it's quite a it's quite a challenge in terms of the GMP cleaning application space because um, we really want, and I come from biopharmaceutical manufacturing, I come from biomedical device manufacturing, you really don't want any of your raw materials or cleaning agents to ever change. You want to have consistency of that product. And with that, you know, sometimes uh, these companies have 20, 30, even longer um, years, uh, the products have been out there and they have been great performance in the industry. And it's a matter of taking a look at that formulation and then looking at not necessarily a next generation, but mm-hmm. a contingency formulation. And you're looking at making certain that you are thinking about the future. And that's kind of, that's what sustainability is. And so if there's concerns about, you know, analyzable surfactants or understanding viral inactivation as a part of the cleaning process, then you want to develop data to support that, that application. Um, and, you know, the nice thing about when you're looking at formulation, you can actually, um, you now have a clean slate to do that um, so that you can put in um, components in there that are, that are um, geared for that type of elements. So I know um, for an example, um, we have, um, I've seen an alkaline product, an acid product, and an additive product with um, hydrogen peroxide in it as an oxidative agent. You can use a UPLC method to show removal of all three of those chemicals in a single um, assay. You know, so there is some innovation out there, and. Um, and that's something that you can obviously, if you're having issues with your cleaning process, um, then it's, it's sometimes good to, to explore that as part of that sustainability um, goal at the sites. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks, Prana. Would anyone else like to ask Paul a question? In the meantime, I've posted up a link to a survey uh, so that we can gather your feedback. We would very much appreciate your comments and uh, feedback so that we can improve. Um, Also, if anyone was unable to catch the session from the beginning, we will be posting a recording of this session on the ISPE Singapore affiliate YouTube page which I've just uh, posted a link for as well, so that you can uh, ask your questions to uh, Paul as well as the team later as well. If there's any more, if does anyone have any more questions? This is your last chance. <laughs> <laughs> Before we let Paul go and uh, to thank him for sharing part of his evening with us. Um, and also to the rest of the Steris team for joining our session this morning. Uh, we want to thank you all for joining this uh, morning as well. Does anyone, just last chance, if anyone has a question? Otherwise, we will be closing. Okay, well, I think, Paul, obviously, you've covered it all really well. And uh, everyone's happy and uh, ready to go. So um, thank you very much for your time this evening for you, Paul, and wish you a a good rest of uh, night. And uh, to everybody else, thank you for joining us this morning. And we look forward to seeing you at future events and uh, to welcoming you. Take care, everybody. Have a great day and uh, see you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank Thank you. Thank you.